Good afternoon. It's morning here in the States, and it's a very uh, uh, big pleasure to be here at the Lakes Festival. I, <clears throat> I went there in person a few years ago, and I hope I'll be there in person again sometime soon, but we'll, we'll just do it virtually this time. Welcome. I'm glad you guys can make it. What I'm going to do here this morning is I'm going to talk about my approach to caricature and what I look for in the face, how I choose to exaggerate people. That's really the hard part about doing caricature is, is deciding what's important about the face you're looking at and what you want to exaggerate. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to start out with a little lecture about my approach and uh, sort of my, my concepts behind caricature. And then I'm going to draw some faces and hopefully you guys have some pencils and papers along with uh, you so that you can draw along with me. And I'm going to uh, kind of go through my process and, uh, and talk about my observations of the face I'm drawing and then and then draw it for you right on the spot. And then at the very end, I'll do one last drawing. And during that drawing, um, people will be able to ask me some questions. So uh, that's kind of how this is going to go today. So why don't we get started? I got to do some techie stuff here. All right. Here we go. So the art of caricature. Well, usually when you start doing these kinds of things, you always start out with a definition, right? So, so what exactly is a caricature? Well, if, uh, if you do live caricature like I did for about 25 years, um, most people would answer that question. Oh, that's when they, the, they take the subject and just draw a big nose on them or something like that. That couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, the best definition I've ever heard was by a, an American caricature illustrator named John Cash and he calls a caricature uh, is a portrait with the volume turned up <coughs> excuse me and I love that definition because that's really what it is a caricature takes the I, the things that make someone unique and exaggerates those things to point them out and so it's literally taking what makes you you and turning up the volume on it and pointing it out. And that's really, uh, that's really what a good caricature does. It captures more than just the likeness of the subject. It does more than just exaggerate their features. It, it captures what makes them unique. Um, we spend our entire lives staring into the faces of our fellow humans. Like we interact face to face with tens of thousands of people over our lifetime from those we only meet once while ordering lunch sometime to our family and friends and coworkers we might see on a daily basis for, for decades. As a result, we are uniquely attuned to the su subtleties and intricacies of the face. Because all humans have basically the same types of features and we have become intimately familiar with them, we perceive what are really only small differences in the size, shape, and relationships of those features as very dramatic. They, uh, caricatures appear all around us, you know, we see them in advertising, on the sides of trucks, in, 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 in ads. They illustrate articles promoting or reviewing books, films, movies, and things like that. You can see them being drawn right in front of you by artists at amusement parks and fairs and festivals. And it's the slight curl of a lip, the, the one eyebrow raised higher than the other, the, the crooked grin. These and similar small elements of a person's features become the cornerstones of what makes that subject unique and recognizable. It's the animation of the same muscles, bones, and physical features we all share that a caricaturist can exaggerate to bring the personality and presence of the subject uh, to life. Caricature is so much more than just the meat and bones of the features. That's really very true because um, it's not just the features that you're that you're drawing. It's the animation behind the features that you're really trying to capture. Um, it's this is kind of a macabre example, but I'm sure most everybody has been to a funeral in their time, right? And how many times have you heard somebody say, "Boy, that the the person in that in the coffin doesn't look like the person I knew in life." Why not? I mean, it's the same bones and skin, and you know, all the same features are there. What, what was animating it isn't there anymore. That's, that's really what causes us to, to, to be recognizable is the animation behind the features, not just the meat and bones. If you've seen um, really good impressionists, comedians that do impressions, oftentimes they look like the person they're, they're doing the impression of. They start to look like Jack Nicholson. They start to look like they're the person. They're, they're animating their faces in the same way with the same expressions, even though they have completely different features, 
there's a resemblance. They look like the person there um, that they are uh, uh, trying to mimic because that's the animation behind the features. And that's really a big part of caricatures, capturing those, that animation. Behind the surface of style and technique, really all caricatures seem the same, share the same fundamentals. Uh, they, these involve care, careful observation of the features and expression and then exaggerating. In many ways, a caricature can be more recognizable than a portrait because it can go beyond the features. It can capture, describe who the subject is, that animation, not just what the subject looks like, not just their physical features. The physical features are really only the tools that you're using to describe the person. Uh, a few years ago, a university did a study on how humans recognize faces as part of an effort to develop facial recognition software. And it was found during that study that people recognize other people faster from caricatures of them than they do from photographs of them. Well, why would that be? It's because caricatures point out the things that, that we, the, the, the hallmarks or the landmarks of the face that make that person recognizable from somebody else and turns up the volume on it, exaggerates it. That's why sometimes a caricature can look more like the person than the person looks like the person. A good caricature captures the personality, the attitude, and the intangible essence of a subject. It goes where a portrait cannot go because it can amplify and accentuate those elements of a person that makes them unique. Elements like expression become the focus of exaggeration, like Clint Eastwood's squint-eyed scowl here. Uh, suddenly the caricature is more than just a description of the features. It captures what makes a subject unique, what makes them them. Portrait artists draw what the face looks like. They deal in fixed absolutes. Caricature artists draw what the face feels like. They deal in perception. It's the caricaturist's job to describe how they perceive the subject to the rest of the world through their caricature. It's much like telling a story. The language used in the story is the interplay between the artist's drawing skills and the actual features of the subject. What a caricaturist must do is recognize where their perception of a given subject's face diverges from well, for lack of a better term, a normal face, and to emphasize those differences by exaggerating them. This person's eyes are close together, or that person has a large jaw. Those are observations based mainly on perception. The measurable differences in anatomy are minute. That's what makes caricature such a personal subjective form of expression. So what makes a good caricature? Well, I believe there are three essential elements that need to be present in some form for a caricature to be successful. And those three elements are recognizability, exaggeration, and something that I call presence. So what are those elements? Well, recognizability. A good caricature must be instantly recognizable as the subject, regardless of the level of exaggeration the artist applies to the subject's features. If it doesn't read as a subject, it's not a successful caricature. Notice I did not say it must have a likeness, meaning it must be recognizable as the subject via the features themselves. The likeness can be independent of recognizability. You can recognize a subject in a caricature in other ways than likeness of features. More stylized caricatures can depend on things like very distinct features represented by more abstract elements rather than by accurately drawn facial detail. A caricature can also utilize things like trademark clothing, hairdos, or other well-known unique aspects of a subject. This is especially important when it comes to using um, caricature in animation character design. The caricatures of famous people making cameos as themselves on animated television shows like The Simpsons or Futurama must be recognizable as the celebrities they depict, but still conform to the rigid style of the animation design. So you really don't have the features to play with. The features are immaterial for the most part. So the recognizability must be accomplished in other ways. This caricature doesn't have any features. So there is no likeness here. Yet, if you know who, who Slash is, you know immediately who this is, um, even though there aren't any features. Well, you know, the hair, the hat, the glasses, the, the cigarette, and also his body language. And this is how Slash plays the guitar. He slings it down low by his knees and leans backward with the neck sticking practically straight up. That's uh, part of his persona and his look. And so I didn't even have to draw his features to make that caricature work. While some style of, styles of caricature incorporate other factors to create recognizability, I personally think that likeness is the strongest foundation upon which to build. It's the base upon which the weight of the caricature is supported. If through the features themselves, you can capture the subject's likeness in a caricature, 
and the addition of the other trademark elements simply acts as further cement for your caricature's already strong recognizability. Exaggerations, the second uh, thing that you need to have to make a, a caricature successful. Obviously, a portrait is based entirely on likeness and technique, and there is little room for subjectivity in a traditional portrait. The face being depicted is the face being depicted. And outside of style and rendering and medium, the success of a portrait hinges on the same conditions in all cases. It must look like the subject. A caricature also should look like, or more accurately, be recognizable as the subject. But the added element of how the caricaturist chooses to exaggerate the model makes it a much more subjective and personal representation than a portrait. The addition of exaggeration into the equation is what makes caricature the wildly diverse art form that it is. Exaggeration can go way beyond the features. Elements like expression, body language, and posture all play into it. This uh, caricature of um, Coco is uh, uh, based a lot on his physicality. Uh, he's got a very, he's got a long, lanky body. He's got super long legs. Um, you know, when you think of, uh, of his facial features, he's got that wild hair and everything. But this caricature plays into uh, a lot more than that. It, it also um, takes into account his physicality and that, and that can be a major element for, especially for certain subjects. Exaggeration of a given subject in caricature is not a constant. Um, the art of caricature can encompass everything from the mildly exaggerated portraiture to the most outrageous, crazy, face melting, extremely exaggerated depiction. The level is limited by the artist's ability to retain, to retain the recognizability. There is a point beyond which further exaggeration would cause likeness or recognizability to be lost. And as a result, the caricature would fail. So learning to push that boundary without overstepping it is a goal for any caricaturist. Exaggeration is also not limited by a single choice about what to stretch in a given face. Each face has multiple elements that can be focused on in the pursuit of an exaggeration. There is no one way to caricature a face. Uh, one caricaturist could decide that a subject's eyes are the focal point of the exaggeration, while another might see the same subject's chin as something that needs particular attention. The your choices you make on a given face, they, you can make wrong choices, right? Like you could say, this person's got big eyes and they don't, they've got little tiny eyes. That would be a wrong choice. But most faces have got multiple things that are correct choices. Ones that they, the sort of the face is asking for you to exaggerate and you can key in on uh, or emphasize one over the other while another artist might choose a different one to emphasize. And both artists could create a very strong caricature of that subject, even though they made different choices. Each subject's face and features and presence dictates the exaggerations a character can play with. Like a, the face tells you what needs to be exaggerated. While there is no one way to exaggerate someone, there are wrong ways to exaggerate someone. Taking a feature and making it bigger or smaller without a reason is, isn't exaggeration, it's distortion. Given a subject, giving a subject who has a small button nose, for example, a big bulbous nose would be distortion. Distortion is exaggeration without reason or purpose. Caricature is exaggeration for a reason. Caricature is exaggeration with a purpose. It's up to the caricature artist to make those decisions and find the ones that work. And finally, there's that term that I call presence. And frankly, I think this really is the, the focal point uh, of a caricature, is capturing more than just the features, capturing the person's presence. Well, what is presence? I use this term to encompass many different factors that add into the impact of the caricature. Personality might be a different word to use. Narrative might be another. What I mean by this is reaching past the surface features of the subject and capturing some of the intangibles that make that subject a living, breathing person. It is the way that a good caricaturist goes beyond capturing the look and enters the realm of describing the subject's personality and essence. Caricatures that capture these intangibles hit their mark so accurately that viewers are almost caught off guard as they exclaim, hey, that's him or that's her, a reaction that a Murr portrait would not elicit. There are many different ways that an artist kind of can accomplish this. One of the key tools that can help a caricaturist make a statement is expression. The animation behind the features has as much to do with how we recognize people as does the meat and bone that those features are made of. Capturing someone's typical expression imbues a caricature with a life and personality far beyond the features themselves. The raised eyebrow, the crooked smirk, 
the squinty eyes or the crinkled nose describes that person rather than just the features. It's by capturing those intangibles that a character just really captures their subject. Sometimes picking an iconic expression, especially if you're drawing a celebrity, is really important. Um, person Presence equals personality equals expression, basically. All three of these are using an iconic expression that you would associate with that subject. Uh, the one of Katie Couric, um, she has got this big, giant, toothy grin. And I could have drawn a, a Katie Couric that looks very angry or you know, upset uh, and maybe gotten a decent likeness of her, but would it really have been her? I wouldn't have been describing her as we recognize Katie Couric without a better choice of expression. Um, the one of Lewis Black here in the middle, he's got this smart Alex smirk on his face all the time, another iconic expression. And by by capturing that expression, the, the tilted head, the crooked, you know, smirky grin, um, the one eye open a little bit more, the, that captures his presence uh, a lot more than just accurately drawing his eyes, nose and mouth. And uh, there's you know, Lucille Ball's what did I just do that expression? That's what I mean by capturing presence. And uh, that, that involves some study of your subject and kind of an understanding of what it is that makes them them. This is the real challenge for caricature artists is learning to see. Drawing caricatures is a lot more about seeing what makes the person in front of you unique and your personal interpretation of that uniqueness than it is about making good, confident marks on the paper. And that's really hard to teach. For example, I can explain to students exactly how to draw a circle. I can show them what a circle looks like and how to draw curves to create it and demonstrate drawing it in a thousand different ways. However, if I place a picture in front of a circle before them and ask them to draw it and they each draw a square, well, the problem lies in how they are seeing and not how they are drawing. The ability to see and after that, the ability to exaggerate what you see for humorous effect in a caricature, those are skills that you have to develop. For the for most, that means a lot of drawing and a lot of looking. It's the subjects who have no obvious features ripe for exaggeration that are the challenge for most caricature artists. That's where developing your ability to see becomes important. There is no face that defies caricature. You just sometimes have to dig a little bit deeper. The ability to see doesn't spring up overnight. And I often tell eager young caricatures that they have about 500 to 1,000 or so bad caricatures in them before they start noticing the subtle things that hide inside the ordinary face. I have new artists that come to work for me at the theme parks. And when they first start, um, first sit down and start to draw uh, at the beginning of the summer, I tell them, look, while you're sitting here, people are gonna be walking past you and maybe one out of every 10 persons that walked past you is going to have a face where you just go, oh, oh my gosh, I'd really love to draw that person. Look at that nose or look at those eyebrows or something about that face just jumps right out at you and you immediately see exactly what you want to key in on, on that caricature. The next nine people that walk by, you just go, oh man, what am I supposed to do with that face? It's boring. It's just, you know, there's nothing about that face to draw. But at the end of the summer, after you've drawn three or 4,000 faces, suddenly maybe three out of every 10 people that walk by have got one of those faces that just something jumps out at you and you immediately know what you want to do. Well, guess what? People didn't get funnier looking in the three months you were drawing caricatures here at the theme park. Your sight got better. You're seeing things that were there before and you were just missing them. Now you're seeing them. That's developing your sight. The encouraging thing is that the more you develop your eye and learn to see, the fewer and fewer faces def defy your ability to find something to play with. More and more faces begin to have things that jump out at you, things that you might not have noticed before. To be more accurate, these are things that you likely saw before, but you never perceived as unique. Uh, somebody might walk by the same brick wall every day for years, and then one day suddenly notice that one of the bricks is of a different color than the rest of them. After that, it becomes impossible for him to walk by without seeing that odd brick. It has always been there and it is doubtless, he's doubtless seen it many times, but he just didn't notice it until then. This man, this man has a crooked nose and I exaggerated that factor. Um, but I had to see it first, right? That's the trick. So it's, it's developing your sight to be able to see what makes this face unique and then exaggerate it. That's the, that's the challenge for caricature artists. 
Many consider the human face to be an incredibly complex object to draw. There are about 52 muscles in the face. The actual number varies depending on your source. Um, sounds pretty complicated, right? Not really. Every building, no matter how complex, starts out with a foundation and framework. Look at this simple drawing. Show this to any human being in the world and ask them what it is. Without fail, they will tell you it is a person's face. In its most basic form, the human face is made up of only five simple shapes. Place these shapes in their proper relationship and you have a human face. It's really that simple. Drawing these basic shapes accurately so that they rep recognizably represent the subject's features is the basis for a good likeness. Beyond that, it's nothing but details. De things like wispy hair, dimples, wrinkles, eyelashes, creases, freckles, whatever, any of the other facial specifics. They are the decor for your building. The millwork, furniture, and drapery, that's what makes the place unique and filled with life, but without a strong foundation, it can all come tumbling down. If a caricature has a secret key, it's understanding relationships. The manipulation of the relationships of the five shapes forms the bedrock of any caricature. In fact, I'd argue that 90% of the entire caricature resides in how you relate these five simple shapes to one another. Those relationships are the foundation upon which the rest of your building is built, where the po real power of exaggeration is realized. Make it effective and hopefully dynamic and almost all the heavy lifting is done. So essentially what I do is I take a face and I, and I break it down into those five simple shapes. And then I manipulate those relationships. I exaggerate the relationships of those shapes uh, to create my caricature. Well, what do I mean by relationships? Well, I mean the distances between the, the size relate relative to the different five shapes, the distance between those five shapes, and the angle that those five shapes are at to one another. Those three relationships are, are what I look to exaggerate with those five shapes. So what do I mean by size? Well, if somebody's got a little tiny nose or I perceive it as a tiny nose, I make the nose smaller and I make the other features around it bigger to make that nose look even smaller. The distance, if somebody's got a long nose, maybe they've got a lot of space between their nose and their mouth, those, those are distances that can be exaggerated. And angle, well, that's a little bit more complicated, but let's say somebody's eyes are slightly uh, upturned, like they, the outside of their eyes is ho are higher than the inside of their eyes. I can exaggerate that angle by making the eyes higher, the outside higher than the inside and really give them that cat-eyed look. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe the outside of their eyes is lower than the inside of their eyes inside corners. And so they have sort of the, the sleepy Sylvester Stallone looking eye. I can exaggerate that angle. Uh, the angle of the mouth, you know, the crooked smile, there has a, there's a lot of presence in uh, crooked smile. So that's uh, something that I always look for. In traditional portraiture, the head shape is divided into classic or golden proportions, meaning the features are within a certain accepted distance of one another, as are their size and angle relative to the face and head shape. If you achieve your likeness in a classic portrait by correctly drawing the shapes and then the details of each feature according to the model in front of you, while you're staying within the framework of these classic proportions, you have a good portrait. Of course, each face varies minutely here and there, but portraits still do not stray far from the classic formula. In a caricature, like a portrait, the likeness is also achieved by drawing the features as they really look, either by drawing them accurately or representing them in a way that, that reads as those features. Uh, but you change the relationship of those features based on your perceptions of the face. So here are, here's the classic proportions of the face as most portraitists uh, consider it. We're trying to change those proportions as much as possible. So you draw the features accurately, just like you would with a portrait, but it's these relationships that you're trying to change. So how do I construct a caricature? Well, I, I do it in basically two steps. I do uh, first what I do, what I call the under caricature or the deconstruction of the face. And then I do what I call the surface caricature or the reconstruction of the face. And essentially what that means is the under caricature is, are those five shapes that I mentioned earlier, the head shape, two eye shapes, nose shape and a mouth shape. That's the under caricature. I'm trying to simplify the face. You wanna boil it down to the simplest of shapes because it makes it much easier to play around with the relationships of the features when you're only working with simple, simple shapes. If you're thinking about the complexity of the face and all the wrinkles and the eyelashes and all and all those you know the little um, creases and things like that, 
then it becomes a lot more complicated to try to get a handle on how you want to exaggerate those relationships. But if you're thinking about nothing but this simple shape, it makes it a lot easier to play with distance, size, angle. Those kinds of things are, are much easier to do when you're manipulating just very simple shapes. So the, the very first thing you do is boil the face down to as simple uh, shapes as you can, and then play around with those features at that level to create your under caricature. Then you go back on top of your under caricature and do your surface caricature, add in all the details that create and bring it to life. So a lot of your heavy lifting is done at that under caricature level. You've chosen how to exaggerate the relationships of those features. Now your job is to just draw those features back on top of those choices you make and bring it to life, like uh, this caricature of Madonna. Here's another example. Here's an under caricature, okay? Very simple shapes, my, but look at some of my choices. I made the eyes really close together. I gave this person a big mouth. That head shape is very unique. It's got that crooked mouth. Add on all the surface stuff, brings it to life. Here's another one. Very simple shapes. Cannot, uh, I cannot stress that enough. You've got to think of this, the face in as simple a terms as possible at this level. The under caricature should be very, very simple shapes, very simple drawing. But those choices are very powerful that you make at this level. Here I made this, this person's got a squat face. It's very wide. Uh, tiny little features sort of in the middle. No likeness, no recognizability right now. This is all just the meat and potatoes of the caricature, but you add in all the details, the surface stuff, and brings it to life. And suddenly it's Jack Black. Now, if you go back and see, there's a lot of elements of Jack Black's face that have nothing to do with this, right? Where are his eyebrows? They're not part of the five shapes. They're not part of the under caricature. That's all surface stuff. Believe me, there's a lot of of power and, and work to be done at the surface level too. Those, his arched eyebrow, you know, the, uh, his, his kind of uh, puckery mouth, those kinds of things are all surface things that are added in later and they're very important. But really it's these choices here at this level that is where the really heavy lifting happens when it comes to exaggeration. Here's another example. So very simple under caricature, add in the, the surface caricature and Ed O'Neill springs to life. So two steps, right? You've got the deconstruction of the face, making that simple under caricature and then reconstructing it with the details. It sounds real easy, but there's a lot, of, there's a lot to it. Um, so we now know it's the relationships between features that are the driving force behind caricature, but what exactly is it about those relationships? If caricature is about changing the relationships between features based on the artist's perception of what is considered normal, then what is considered normal? Well, deciding what relationships to change and how much to change them is one of the caricature's most important jobs and one of the most difficult to learn. Again, the actual difference between the, measure, the relationships of features from human to human does not add up to much in terms of physical measurements. A big nose may be only a fraction of an inch larger than a normal nose. Yet we can discern the different feature relationships in almost any, anybody, some of which seem very pronounced. Our ability to observe minute differences is very fine tuned thanks to our being social animals. Mostly it's an unconscious process, but our brains see that fraction of an inch larger nose is big, or this person's eyes is large, or that person's mouth is small, based not so much on physical measurements, but rather on our overall perception of the features and how they relate to one another. Bringing those ob observations into our conscious perception, especially for those faces without obvious unique aspects, is the most difficult part of drawing characters. Luckily, there are some techniques that, and methods you can use to help you make those observations. So you always start somewhere, right? And the best place is what is considered a normal relationship of features. There are two reasons for this. First, knowing these classic proportions will help you observe where your perception of the faces, a subject's face might differ from the norm by providing a point of reference to which you can compare your subject. Second, once you've made these observations, you can then use that same point of reference, the classic por portrait proportions, for example, as a baseline, a place to move further and further away from to create your caricature. So in this method, a front view of the face is five eyes, uh, eye widths wide, and a single eye width between the eyes and nose, and another between the outside corners of the eyes and the edge of the head. 
Uh, the nose is one eye width wide. So these are like the golden proportions. And this is what you would consider your baseline. And your job is to see how is this face that I'm looking at different from that? And how can I exaggerate it to get as far away from this as I possibly can and still create recognizability? Um, this is just another example of a way to uh, consider what's normal or golden proportions, the equilateral triangle. There's supposed to be an exact uh, equilateral triangle between the outside corners of the eyes and the bottom of the lip, lower lip. Uh, there are many standards like that. You can, you can look up all sorts of different portrait uh, tricks and pro golden proportions. But the point is you need to, you need to consider what is typical of a face and then, and then decide what is it about my face that I'm trying to draw that is different from that and then exaggerate those differences. Do all human faces really conform to these exact relationships? No, of course not. That's the point of caricature. There are differences from this face to that, some very slight and others more pronounced. And the caricature artist exaggerates these differences to create a caricature. Knowing what layout is expected to be there is half the battle when it comes to seeing where things are different. Again, making these observations is the trickiest part of doing caricature, but the good news is you don't have to come up with a shopping list of differences in order to do a caricature. In fact, all you have to do is come up with one good observation, really just one. And you can use that one observation as your cornerstone and build your caricature around it. It could be as simple as this person has a skinny face or big eyes or a small mouth or a square jaw or a bent nose or whatever. The more observations, the better, but really you can hang your hat on just one. Why is only one observation enough? Because all the features relate to one another fundamentally. You cannot make a change to one feature without affecting the others. This is one of the few constants you can rely on with respect to drawing caricatures, action and reaction. In physics, every action creates a, causes an equal and opposite reaction. In caricature, the action of changing relationship of a single feature to the others causes the others to react in often predictable ways. You cannot change the eyes without affecting the nose, the mouth, the head shape, and so on. And so that's, and how that change affects other features allows for the most part a set path. So in this image, for example, the one on the left is, okay, this is, this is the, what the guy really looks like, uh, but boy, I think his eyes are kind of far apart. I want to move his eyes farther apart. Well, you don't just move the eyes far apart like the middle drawing here. When you move the eyes far apart, what happens? Well, the face gets a little wider and then the face will probably get a little squatter. And then the nose moves closer to the eyes and all the features move closer to the eyes as the eyes move far apart. So there's, a, there's things that happen to the face based on that one observation. That's why you can uh, just build something around a single one. I've talked a lot about simplifying the face by boiling it down to the five shapes, but it can get even simpler than that in terms of both making observations and playing with the relationships of features to make a caricature. In fact, I believe there are two absolutely crucial key um, components to any caricature, the head shape of what I call the T shape. I look at these two elements first and try to make observations about them because they allow me to push, stretch, and exaggerate the face to great effect with relative ease. So this is what I mean by the T shape. I'm talking about the geometric shape created by the eyes and the nose together as if they were uh, one unit. In simplest terms, they create a capital T. The simple shape describes the relationship between these important facial elements, making it into a single unit or single shape. This makes exaggerating the eyes and nose relationship much easier because you can ignore all the details of the features themselves and concentrate on manipulating just the T shape. When I talk about uh, this is exactly what uh, T shapes are. So you can see sometimes the arms of the T will be much longer and the stem of the T will be much shorter or the opposite. Sometimes it can be more of an arrow shape if the eyes are, are somewhat downturned. Um, and it's not just a T like as lines, it's a geometric shape that encompasses the volume, the entire air surface area of those, um, of those features as well. There's a lot more. Uh, examples of, of basic T shapes. So, you know, you, you're definitely thinking about the width of the nose at the, at the top and at, uh, at the bridge and at the base, how the eyes relate to the nose in terms of angle, um, how much surface area, if the eyes are real big, those arms of the T will be really tall and thick. If the arms, are, if the eyes are real squinty, your T is going to be very thin. Um, the relationship of the eyes and nose inside the T kind of follows a certain uh, action reaction sort of a, a process. So um, when the eyes are moved far apart, almost always the nose will automatically move closer in because that, that 
causes you to perceive the eyes as being even farther apart. If the eyes are moved closer together, the nose tends to move farther away. That's because that makes the eyes look even closer together. It's not 100% true, but it's, it's like that in most cases. So if you're going to have a short stem on your T, you're probably going to have wide arms of your T. If, if your arms of your T are real narrow because your eyes are close together, you're probably going to have a longer stem. But those, the, the relationship of the, uh, some of the shapes follow those kinds of patterns. For example, the nose and mouth. If you make an observation and say, boy, this person's mouth seems really close to their nose, I want to exaggerate that distance, then you not, don't just move the eyes, the mouth closer to the nose, you also move the chin farther away because that makes the mouth look even closer to the nose. Those kinds of, uh, of action reaction kind of things can help you build a caricature around a single observation. The T shape and head shape combine to create the base of your caricature basically. Over them, the five shapes further define the relationships of the features and over the five shapes, you do your surface caricature to really add the features themselves. Things like bone structure, anatomy, expression, skin, hair, and other details work, further work to create the likeness and bring the underlying structure to life in the surface caricature. But it's really all built on those simple foundations. I would suggest as an exercise to set aside the notion of rendering and drawing details on characters for a moment and instead fill up a few sketchbook pages with nothing but the head shape and T shapes of some faces from a magazine or some other uh, resource. Draw one quickly using just initial observations and first impressions of the face, then look back at it and try to see where it differs from the normal template of classic proportion. Then try it again, this time exaggerating what you produced in your first try. Do this with a dozen faces a day and watch how your ability to see the caricature in a given face develops. It's a good exercise for any caricaturist, no matter what your skill level is. So I've spoken about the five shapes and the importance of their relationships already, but let's dig a little deeper. It's fair to say that the head shape is the primary shape or the alpha shape and the other four shapes are its, are the, its planets to its sun. If a caricature artist can see and exaggerate the head shape, all the other features seem to fall into place. Head shape is the most powerful tool in your toolbox. Look at these very simple drawings. The basic shapes, except for the head shapes, are pretty much the same. By changing the relationships of the five shapes, very different characters are created. It's in this deconstruction of the face into its five shapes that all the heavy lifting of a caricature and exaggeration is done. It's at this level that you create your caricature of the subject and where the real power of a caricature lies. The head shape is the fulcrum upon which the caricature hinges. The main power of all your exaggeration is accomplished through the shape of the head and realizing this can help you focus your efforts. By treating the head shape as a single shape, it is easier to recognize how that shape differs from normal and is easier to draw still to draw a corresponding simple shape that exaggerates those properties as opposed to the more complex multiple relationships that go on in between the features. By stretching and exaggerating that head shape, you can create the framework within which your other features and their relationships can be drawn to achieve your caricature. So again, you start out with what's normal. In a typical head shape, you usually have basically kind of a flattened egg shape uh, and you're going to have equal mass above and below the eyes. The eye line, the, the line that crosses the head shape where the eyes are, has equal mass above or below it in classic proportion. So that's actually my very first observation with any caricature, is I look to see if I can exaggerate the imbalance between the mass above the eyes and below the eyes. A very, very simple observation, but something that has a lot of power to it. The head shape is really comp. comp uh, comprises many different features, including cheekbones and stuff. But the trick is to simplify it as much as you can so that, so that you can manipulate and work with a much simpler shape. Um, one trick I use a lot is thinking about them as as simple a geometric shape as possible. Now, you can see the under caricatures here, or the actual caricatures are a lot more complicated. The girl in the lower left, her head isn't shaped like a triangle. It doesn't have pointy square tops and or pointy edges and, and uh, uh, at the top. But basically, she's got a triangular shaped head. It's wide at the top. It's narrow at the bottom. Uh, all these other head shapes are very essentially very simple geometric shapes. Another trick I use a lot is looking to see where's the widest part of the face. You know, where's the weight of the face lie? Is it above or below the eyes? Where's the widest part? Usually wherever the face is widest tends to have the most mass. I'll also look for 
uh, you know, line contour lines that help me see simple shapes. Where does the, the jaw break and change in direction? Is that a very angular line? Is it a very curved line like it is on the guy in the right? Um, can I draw the face shape with one line instead of thinking about all the little bumps and lumps that make up all the different um, contour lines of the actual face? Trying to simplify it is uh, an absolute key. And then exaggerating the head shape and balance, like I, like I just mentioned. Can I, uh, does, the, does my subject have more mass below the face? Can I exaggerate that? And how far can I push it? Do they have more mass above the eyes? Can I exaggerate that? How far can I push it? Um, here's an example. This, this is David Ortiz, uh, an American baseball player. He's got a lot of jaw. He's got this huge, massive bottom of a face. And so I was able to exaggerate the imbalance between the top and bottom of his features. Another trick I use for head shape is shape association. It sounds silly, but the pear-shaped head is something that I see a lot. You know, somebody that's got a lot of weight and roundness in the bottom of their face and the small top of the head. Uh, the peanut-shaped head is another one you see a lot where it's squeezed in the temple and people have got uh, wider foreheads and wider bottoms of faces. And I use this technique for a lot of things. I'll, I'll, look, I'll look at features and say, hey, that guy's eye, eyebrows are shaped like the state of Massachusetts or whatever whatever you can come up with that helps you simplify and grasp the shapes that you're looking at um, will help you to be able to exaggerate those things. So the concepts I've shared with you today are just the basic foundation of the art of caricature. Understanding the face and its many simple intricacies of expression and articulation is a lifelong pursuit. But the fundamental tools of a caricaturist lie in simplifying the face into its base components and manipulating the relationships of those shapes to create a strong caricature. By breaking the face down into its basic five shapes or even further into the head shape, T shape, the caricaturist can more easily see and apply exaggeration. Then over that deconstruction, they reconstruct the face using whatever style of drawing or rendering they work in. In this way, caricatures are fundamentally style independent. An artist who is very cartoony in their drawing use the same observational and exaggeration techniques as an artist who does detail paintings or 3D renderings. The job of a caricaturist is to identify what it is about their subject that makes them unique and then points out those unique elements by exaggerating them visually. In this way, the caricature artist captures more than just the facial features. They capture the personality and presence of their subject in a way photos can't. Caricature is a very personal form of art where you bring your perception of your subject to life and tell their story through your eyes to your audience. If you take nothing else away from this workshop today, I hope you have, I have opened your eyes on how to look at a face differently, and how to begin to see the relationships between the features that are the cornerstones of exaggeration. All right. I think we're back to the camera. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna switch to my Cintiq here and we're gonna, do, we're gonna draw a couple faces and I'm gonna kind of demonstrate the uh, deconstruction and reconstruction uh, of, of a face using a specific subject. So if you've got any, um, hang on a second here. If you've got a pencil and paper, draw along with me. I'll be, I'll be putting a uh, face up here. Tom, I'm just aware of the time. Um, mm -hmm because we can't go too much over on this one right. because we've got, um, we've, we've been a little bit late. Um, so if we can go no later than quarter past five, that would be great. Oh, we don't have to go that late. I'll just draw these quick. <laughs> but All right. That's, so that's how much overflow you get. <laughs> got it. All right. Can you see my, uh, can you see Daniel Radcliffe here? Are we up and running? All right, I think we're there. I, I can't tell, so I'm hoping that uh, that you can see my Daniel Radcliffe here. Yes, he's there, it's all good. All right, terrific. So here's our subject, Daniel Radcliffe, okay? Here's another trick. When you're doing caricatures, you don't, you wanna have other, you wanna have more than one photo, okay? You can definitely base your caricature on a single photo, but you don't want to, um, you don't want to only rely on one photo. You wanna have other photos because it'll help you to see different aspects of the face and be able to um, 
be able to uh, uh, help you see things that the other photo might not have showed you. So, so we're going to start out by doing my deconstruction. So the first thing I do is I look at Daniel's face and say, okay, uh, imagine a line across his eyes here. Does he have more mass above or below that line? Well, for me, the, absolutely the widest part of his face is way up here, right, in his forehead. So he, I think he has more mass above that line. He also has... He has a very wide jaw, but it's a really small chin. He doesn't have a deep, like thick, heavy jaw. He's got, it's wide, but it's short. So his head shape, I'm going to want to give him a large top of a head and a real flat bottom of a face. And here's his eye line. So this is my deconstruction, right? I'm trying to think in as simple a terms as possible. I'm forgetting about, I'm not thinking about his ears. I'm not thinking about anything except the basic shape of his, his features. Now his T-shape, his eyes are very close together. He's got a very narrow bridge structure. He's got kind of a long-ish nose, but because I, I squashed the bottom of his face, I can't give him very long nose. And his mouth is really close to his, uh, to his nose, so I don't want to give him much space there. In fact, I'm going to give him an even smaller chin. So there's my T shape, okay? My T shape and head shape, very simple. I'm trying to think about in simple is in as simple a terms as possible here. Now, maybe I'll dig a little deeper and I'll actually do the, his, his, his five shapes. So his eye shapes. And even though I'm, I'm trying to stick with simple shapes here, I'm definitely going to draw shapes that do represent the shapes I'm looking at. So he's, he's got very straight across um, lower lids on his eyes and, and all of his, his eyes are curved on the top. So this is it. So this is my very simple basic caricature of uh, under caricature of Daniel Radcliffe's very, very simple, easy, quick. And, uh, but a lot of my caricature decisions here are going to have a lot of power when it comes to, to the final drawing. So let me, I'm just going to knock this down and then I'm going to do my surface caricature now. So I'm going to add all the surface features in. So he's got these really sharp kind of eyes, really long, sharp interior corners of the eyes, very straight across line at the bottom. Um, it's got kind of, you know, not heavy upper eyelids, but they're definitely thick. You can definitely see them all the way across. It's got quite strong bulges of the nose uh, or under the eyes here. It's got a real angular nose. So these are all surface things, right? But I'm sticking with my decisions that I made at that under caricature level. That's very important. I don't want to, I don't want to at this point water down those decisions that I made at that under level. But there's just a lot of other things that happen here at the surface level that really capture that presence. For example, his eyebrows, like he's got very distinct eyebrows and they're very, they're very thick and hairy. Oh, hairy, haha. And um, those are ripe for exaggeration. Like I can exaggerate the size of those. So I'm still, I'm still exaggerating at the surface level. It's just that those under decisions are the real driving force behind it. Head shape, relationships of features, those sorts of things are, I can see that I'm, I've got a little symmetry problem with my drawing here. So I'm gonna use a little digital magic to fix that. Let's see, that's better. And uh, his mouth is real close to his nose. He's got this kind of interesting sort of curvy grin. It's a little crooked. One side's a little farther down than the other side. So all these details really bring it to life. But again, so much of what I what what's really driving this caricature is all done at that under level. A lot of this stuff, a lot of the surface stuff here is just just good drawing. 
like, you know, being able to draw the eyes so they look like his eyes, the nose so it looks like his nose, the mouth so it looks like his mouth. That's that's drawing a technique. And if you're a painter, you know, you'd be doing this with uh, values. And, and if you were a cartoonist, you'd be doing this with lines sort of like I am here. Or if you were, um, you know, more of a realistic portrait artist, you might be rendering and, and shading and doing things like that to, to, to describe and capture these features. But um, so the technique that you use to, to render them is uh, separate from those decisions that you made at that under level. That's stuff that, um, I think I'm a little too fat looking there. That's all, all those decisions are kind of universal. That's what where all caricature artists have their have in common is deciding what at that under level you're, you're, you're exaggerating. Like Hirschfeld, for example, whose style is completely different from what, what I do, still makes those same decisions. In fact, he, he keeps those, uh, those simple shapes as the foundation of his final drawings. And he uses representational uh, objects like curly cues for eyes and stuff to um so I'm doing I'm, I'm drawing real quick here because we want to be able to get a couple of drawings in couldn't resist all right let's do another one Uh -huh. So Scarlett Johansson is, uh, you know, an extremely attractive person. And a lot of people say, oh, it's harder to draw caricatures of really uh, beautiful people. But that's not true. Um, you're just exaggerating what makes them beautiful. You know, not the choices that you make in exaggerating people uh, has nothing to do with with their flaws, okay? You don't exaggerate a person's flaws. You exaggerate what makes them unique. And sometimes that those are things that, you know, make them look ridiculous. And sometimes there are things that make them look beautiful. So here's my uh, exaggeration, my basic head shape for Scarlett Johansson. She's, she's widest right here in the cheekbones, right? So she's gonna have a lot more bottom of a face than top of a head. She's got actually quite a, a big chin and jaw for, uh, um, for a female, most in general, females tend to have smaller jaw lines because they usually have less testosterone in their system and then their mandible bones don't grow as large as, as males do. But it's not a hard, fast rule, but it's just kind of a something that you often see. And with her uh, um, T-shape now, her eyes are actually, she's got smaller kind of uh, really um, heavily lidded eyes. And she's got quite a quite a wide nose. Like she's got a big, wide bottom of a nose. It's sort of upturned, and then she's got a very crooked mouth shape. Like the whole her whole mouth shape is is all crooked to one side. And and then working in her her actual shapes here, I'm actually going to make her eyes a little far apart. Um, she's got very squinty eyes, real heavy lids. So there, there's my basic, I'm gonna make this a little smaller because I wanna be able to fit in her hair. Um, we could push this exaggeration a lot more if you wanted to, it could really go to town on her cheekbones, like go way out here and see how far we can push it. Um, give her a smaller top of the head even. All right, so there's my under caricature, really simple. Right, that's the point. It's supposed to be really simple. You're supposed to try to boil it down to as simple a shapes as possible uh, so that you can manipulate the relationships easier. Now we're gonna go back in and, and draw, do the surface stuff. So she's got these sleepy, very uh, seductive eyes with the heavy eyelids and the heavy eyelashes. Very, very heavy lids, real dark lines that define the top part of her lid. She's got kind of what I call smoky eyes, where uh, part of it is um, you know, maybe some of the cosmetics she uses, but um, she's got kind of a, a little bit of a, the under part of her lid has got a little darkness to it that gives it that kind of smoky, seductive sort of look. She's got quite defined eyebrows. They're very arched. Mm. 
And then, um, well, she's just got a, a pretty big round nose. It's actually quite prominent. You think, oh, she, well, she must have a little button nose. You know, that's not true. And, and certainly people can have very, um, you know, unusual and, and kind of uh, uh, exaggerated features and still have, um, and still be considered really, you know, attractive. It's, it's, it's the whole package put together that, that, that makes, gives people an attractive look or whatever. Big cheekbones on her. And she's got, you know, quite a big chin, actually. Oh, we should, I should put up, here's a couple other pictures of her too. You can really see how, how bulbous the end of her nose is actually, especially in that three quarter view on the left down there. I could spend about a whole afternoon drawing this hair. So I'm just gonna really rough it in. So we've kind of got, we've already got her. The real important stuff established with her here. So I really exaggerated that head shape imbalance with her. I, I gave her a really small top of the head and um, tried to make sure that I stuck with those choices I made uh, at that under caricature level. Okay, so we're, we don't wanna go too much later. So I'm gonna just do one more and now uh, while I'm drawing this last one, if you guys want to ask me some questions, go ahead. We'll, we'll do about five, five, five minutes or so. Oh. It'll just elbow. I'm sure all the ladies are happy we're drawing them. We've got a question it... from Alfred Reed. Are you ready to take okay. questions? Sure. Good Next afternoon, question. Tom. I'm hey, just Alfred. wondering, is it, is it important to have a, an understanding of anatomy when drawing caricatures? I think that it helps a great deal. Um, I've never been a proponent of uh, like having to know the real names of all the muscles and you know the different uh, bones and things like that. That isn't all that important, but understanding how the face really works, I think, is important. Um, so yes, if you if you study real facial anatomy and and really understand how the face really is put together, then it makes it that you're more effective at being able to exaggerate the the thing those things because of it. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. You're welcome. Rob Price wants to know, are you ever afraid to offend people based on their physical quirks? Uh, no, that's why I lift weights, um, because that way, you know, I can, I can physically intimidate uh, my subjects and they don't, but they don't, uh, they don't get upset with me. Are there any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> probably, that one probably shut them down. Got to be careful, otherwise Tom's going <laughs> to. <laughs> okay, we've got a question from Gethin Walters. I love okay. your first caricature book and it's extremely helpful, but do you know when The Mad Art of Caricature 2 will be coming out? Uh, I've got that on indefinite hold, actually. Um, I, I had planned on doing a second version of my book because I've been teaching these workshops all around the world for the last three, three four years or so. And frankly, um, you know, when you teach things, you sort of learn different ways to explain your process. And I've, I've come up with some new concepts that aren't in the, in the original book. Um, but I just, had, I just don't know that, it's, that they're that <laughs> important that I, a, a, new, a new version of the book is necessary. Um, I will say that I am in the process right now of putting together a, a virtual workshop one that you can take online that uh, you'll um, purchase and then you uh, have access to uh, eight different videos uh, where I do, you know, explain my process and talk about 
uh, caricaturing not just the entire face, but individual features and things like that. And it'll also uh, include a personal critique for me on uh, the drawings that you produce for the workshop. So there, I am working on some new resources for learning caricature that uh, will kind of go past the book, but I don't have any plans right now to, to do that second version. Rob Doyle wants to know, how often do you work out? I guess he's trying to see if he could take you. <laughs> uh, I, I, well, I sit on my rear end and draw for a living. So I have to work out, uh, um, you know, often. I work out five days a week. A lot of power lifting, a lot of uh, functional training, that sort of thing. And there's a question that I think you answered when you were explaining about the book. Um, Mark Gilgaro wants to know, when exaggerating Daniel Radcliffe eyebrows, why didn't his hair have to come down closer? Why did you keep the distance between hair and eyebrows? Uh, he's a lot of forehead and I wanted to exaggerate that. Um, oh, uh, I, I'm definitely working from that that smaller or that larger photo and not the bigger one. But if, you know, if I, I, I did that one really quick, if I would have had time, I, I probably would have uh, given him a little bit more hair. Um, but uh, uh, my initial observations were a lot of forehead, small bottom of a face. So I just stuck with those exaggerations. Millistration wants to know, do you find it harder or easier to do caricatures of yourself? I used to have a lot of trouble drawing myself, but now I've drawn myself so many times that I, I can just, I don't even have to have a photograph of me anymore. I just draw it right out of my head. Also, I'm I'm notoriously mean to myself, so that kind of helps. Um, I definitely do not do flattering caricatures of me. I usually uh, try to make myself cry. What features do you uh, rec rec sort of exaggerate in yourself? Oh, I've got a, a really narrow bridge structure of my nose. Um, I've got a smile that goes up on one side and down on the other. Uh, I've got uh, a kind of... Um, uh, sunken chin. Uh, I don't have much of a jawline, so I don't usually get myself a very strong jaw. Uh, very pronounced brow structure, like I've got like almost like a Neanderthal brow. So uh, I'm hideous. Mm -hmm. So it makes it uh, easy to draw. We have a question about, oh gosh, we've got quite a few questions now. Um, yeah, so, so so David Ashton wants to know when will the online tutorials be available and how can they keep informed about the availability? Uh, I'm hoping to have them ready by uh, the end of the year, actually. Um, and uh, if you just follow my uh, follow me online, I've got a blog at tomrichmond.com and I will be announcing when they're available there. And um, I, I have to still work out the logistics of how to, to host them online and how the whole um, access to them and stuff is going to work. So right now I'm working on just putting the material together. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, if you follow TomRichmond.com, I've also got a mailing list. If you go to that blog, there's a little place to sign up for my mailing list. And then you would definitely get uh, notified um, when things are, are up and running. Mm -hmm. Mark Young wants to know, uh, seeing the drawing process on digital is great. What advice do you have for doing live caricature when you don't have the luxury of pre-sketch and making mistakes? Ah, uh, well, the live caricature thing is a whole different animal. You know, it basically when you draw live, you don't have time to do this, you know, the under caricature and, and do, your, do your thinking visually on the paper. You have to do it in your head. So I actually approach it exactly the same way. I think about head shape, T-shape. That's my, uh, where I start. And then um, I draw, but I don't sketch it out. I think about it in my head and I, and I project it on the paper. And then I draw uh, my, I just go in and draw my surface stuff immediately right on top of this sort of mental image that I, I project on the paper. So it's a, it's a very tricky thing, um, but it's a terrific uh way to develop your instincts for drawing the face because you don't have time to think about it. It's what I call reactive or reflective drawing. And it develops your ability to, to capture and see uh, expression and presence in a very quick manner. And then when you go back to doing something in the studio where you've got lots of time to work it out, your instincts are, are better for it. So I highly recommend live caricature for anybody who has any interest in caricature, just, just as an exercise, you know, do it, do it at your 
you know, with all, all your coworkers at a, at an office party or at your kids, uh, you know, birthday party or something, just, just to, uh, just to have fun and kind of get your feet wet with it. Yeah. we got so, time for, I think one more question one and then more we can question. wrap it up. Okay. Let me just have a look at these and choose a good one. Uh, Okay, if anyone has questions about the workshops, um, I'll encourage you to get in touch um, on Tom's social media to see um, updates on that. Um, but this is a good question. Um, what is it like working for a magazine like Viz compared to Mad Magazine? <laughs> well, um... It's, it, my experience is pretty similar because what I do for Viz is almost exactly what I do for Matt. Uh, the guys at Viz send me a script and they've written it all and I just illustrate it. So it's, it's basically, it's a little bit more like comics as opposed to, um, you know, some of the spot stuff I do for Matt. But uh, it, it's a very similar process because I'm just the artist. Now, mo most of the time with with Viz, you know, our, uh, the, the creators there write and draw and just submit their own strips. And uh, uh, I don't know how that process works, but um, I really enjoyed the, the pieces I did for Viz. I haven't done one in a while now, so I don't know, maybe I blew it on my last one and they're not giving me any more work, but, uh, it, but it's been fun um, doing it. So I look forward to another piece with them sometime. Well, asking you shall receive, you know. <laughs> <laughs> This is the moment when I bring in the Viz boys and say, oh, look, <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, Tom, for that. Um, My pleasure. It's been really, really informative. And um, it would be lovely to see uh, what everyone's drawn as well. So if, they, if, if you want to upload um, your pictures to Instagram or put them on your stories, don't forget to tag Tom and yeah, uh, please the do. Links, International Comics. Um, on Instagram or do a hashtag lickaf and we'll see it and we'll repost it and it'd be really great to see what you did. Also, um, I have to just do a quick um, message about sponsors. Uh, so this festival has been brought to you by Arts Council England with support from Lenovo. And what's more, it would be really great if you enjoy this festival, if you've enjoyed this workshop and all of our other content, if you would consider heading to our website and clicking the donate button which is the yellow heart in the top right corner it would really help us out and help us to continue bringing you more fantastic enriching content like this so thank you everybody tom i hope you have a nice day and everyone else and wherever you, you are in the world <laughs> hope you have a lovely evening slash morning <laughs> yeah enjoy the rest of the festival thank you see you soon and this will bye -bye. be posted Thanks. later on bye